Trump versus Biden. Is this the end of Biden? Is this the end of the Democrats? Is Trump going to be the next American president? Now, I'm sure you've heard a, a lot of commentary and a lot of analysis, but I'm here to tell you that all of it is wrong. It doesn't matter who won the debate. It doesn't matter that Biden lost, and it doesn't matter that Trump won, and it doesn't even matter who becomes president. Your vote doesn't count, and your vote won't make a difference. Now, before you switch away, give me a few moments to explain why. Now, as Muslims living in the West, in the last 30 years or so, the Muslim populations in these Western countries, America, UK, France, Australia, they become very significant. And that's why you notice every election time, the politicians spend a portion of their time trying to win and entice the Muslim vote. And you notice our organizations and our mashaykh, they jump on the bandwagon, they bring them ta'id and they bring them into the mosques to try and convince you to vote. And they'll give you sermons and khutbas that voting is good and it's just like consultation and it's allowed in Islam. Not only allowed, now they're even tell telling us that it's mandatory. Why? Because they say we need someone to represent the Muslim voice. We need someone uh, to allow us to build more Islamic schools, to look after Muslim initiatives, even if we can, to vote in Muslim MPs. Now we need to be very, very clear, first and foremost. As Muslims, we all need to be aware of the Sharia ruling. And this is from a fuqhi level, this is a very basic and easy thing to understand, just like you understand the prayer. From an Islamic perspective, when it comes to voting in a man-made system where it elects men and women that legislate rules besides the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is very, very clearly on the very basic fuqhi level, every Muslim can understand this, this is prohibited and it's not allowed and it's a very clear hukum, just like the rule of prayer. But unfortunately, for most Muslims, they've been conned and they've been deluded by the mashayikh, by the organizations, they've twisted the verses, twisted the hadith, to convince you that it's consultation, it's shura, that the Muslim vote counts, that we need to elect representatives that support uh, the Islamic initiatives, that uh, give the Muslims more freedom, uh, that don't oppress the Muslims. And now, with the slaughter and, and the killing that's going on, it's, they'll actually tell you it's mandatory for you to vote. Why? Because your vote counts and you can elect people that will stop the slaughter and stop the killing. But this is all a lie. It doesn't matter which Western country you live in. Because this debate, yes, it happened in America. But these debates happen throughout the whole Western world. And what's the idea with these debates? The debates happen because in these Western countries, they want to convince everyone, look at us, we're advanced, we're civilized, we live in democracies. That's what ever elevates us, that's what makes us different, especially to the Muslims, who are bar barbaric and backward, but we have the rule of law. So every election cycle, they present the candidates, and these candidates, they'll debate each other to present their policies, and then... The viewers can decide who I want to vote for at the next election that best represents me. Well, we're fine. I said the only thing I've denied Israel was 2,000 pound bombs. They don't work very well in populated areas. They kill a lot of innocent people. We're providing Israel with all the weapons they need and when they need. As far as Israel and, and Hamas, Israel's the one that wants to go. He said the only one that wants to keep going is Hamas. Actually, Israel is the one, and you should let him go and let him finish the job. He doesn't want to do it. He's become like a Palestinian, but they don't like him because he's a very bad Palestinian. He's a weak one. The debate doesn't matter. The Trump versus Biden debate doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that Trump won, because really all he had to do was show up, because uh, Biden definitely didn't. But none of it matters. Why? Because it's all a facade. It's all an illusion. There isn't actually any democracy. Why is that the case? Well, look, if you look at, let's look at all these Western countries, the last 30 years or so of the election cycles that have been happening in America, UK, France, Australia, all the Western countries. 
you'll notice every single one of these countries has two main parties. Using America as a template, you either have something that's like the Democratic Party or an equivalent to it, where they say we're all about uh, liberalism and rights and uh, immigration and equality, okay, and they worry less about tradition. You have some kind of equivalent of the Democratic Party and you have some kind of equivalent of the Republican Party where they're more nationalistic, they're anti-immigration, they're more conservative values, more religion. You look across all of these countries, you find some kind of Democratic Party or some kind of Republican Party. Now, in the last 30 years or so, in all of these countries, we've had a mixture of Democratic parties and Republican parties coming into power. Whether you want to, when we look at the US, you've had people, Republicans, leaders like, uh, like Bush Jr., Bush Sr., like Trump, like Reagan. And then you've had Democrats like Clinton, like Obama, like Biden. But you notice it doesn't matter which party is in power, which leader is in power, on the two main fronts, the foreign policy and the domestic policy, you'll notice the same consistent themes. Now domestically, it doesn't matter which party has been power and which country you look at. What do you notice? The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer and the gap is widening. So there's been high cost of living, a rise in electricity, water, rent, it's gotten to a level now. Most people, they're never ever going to be able to own a home. We have had increased taxes, uh, in, in, increased intrusion, less privacy, uh, uh, government uh, dictatorships, lockdowns, uh, vaccinations. This has been consistent across all parties and across all leaders domestically in all of these Western countries, it's been the exact same thing happening. Now you have some different shifts, cosmetic shifts in laws, but by and large, domestically, this is what's been happening. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And government power and dictatorship and intrusion has increased more and more. Now when it comes to foreign policy, if you look at the last 30 years, after the initiation of the war on terror, all these Western countries, when it comes to their foreign policy, they all agree and they've all supported the war on terror. They supported the war in Afghanistan, the invasion in Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq. Uh, they, they support the main state that's killing, butchering Muslims, all of them unequivocally, doesn't matter which country, which leader, which party, they all support and fund this state. They all support the containment of Russia. They all support the containment of China. They all support the containment of North Korea, the containment of Iran. Yes, you got some cosmetic changes here and there, but by and large, this has been Western foreign policy and it has not changed no matter who's leader and no matter who's in power. Now, they'll try and convince you that Trump is a bit different. And this has been the narrative around Trump. And unfortunately, even some Muslim commentators and, uh, 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 and analysts like Sami Hamdi, who I have a lot of respect for, they tried to convince Muslims that, look, just at least if we, don't, if we vote out Biden, even if Trump comes into power, we can affect and change the killing and the slaughter that is happening to the Muslims. It's like um, Trump is anti-war or anti-establishment. Because he tries to build this narrative and this lie. Right? And unfortunately, a lot of people have been fooled by it, even Muslims and Muslim commentators. But the reality is, when Trump came to power in Afghanistan, he increased the drone strikes more than what Obama was doing, killed even more civilians. He increased the support of Saudi Arabia to bomb and slaughter the Muslims uh, of Yemen. He attempted a failed coup attempt in Venezuela, and he said at that time it was for the oil. He tried to instigate North Korea. He moved the capital, the, the, the embassy, American embassy, uh, to Jerusalem for that to be the capital of that state. So this whole narrative is an absolute lie about Trump. He's been supporting the same foreign policy. Yes, cosmetically it might be a bit different. Sometimes they stop a war to increase the activity and the invasion somewhere else. But he's 
just as much for war and invasions as any of those presidents were. How many billions of dollars do you owe in civil penalties for, for molesting a woman in public, for doing a whole range of things, of having sex with a porn star on the night while your wife was pregnant? I mean, what, what, what are you talking about? You, you have the morals of an alley cat. Give me a minute, sir. I didn't have sex with a porn star, number one. Number two, that was a case that was... Another major talking point is that this debate signifies a turning point in American history, and it signifies the imminent collapse of American hegemony and American power and authority all around the world. Why? Because look at the state of its leaders. Look at Biden. I mean, this is clearly a man that is cognitively impaired. He's not fit to walk, let alone lead a country. And then you look at Trump, a sleazeball that's having sex with porn stars, that has litigation after litigation, court case after court case. Surely, if these are the leaders that are representing the American people, surely this, this signifies the demise of the American civilization. Now, this is absolutely and completely false. Why? I'll tell you why. American leaders have been just as dumb and just as sleazy before. And just to give you one clear example, we just have to remember back to the time of Bush Jr. Now, for those of you that aren't old enough to remember, here's a few clips just to show you the state of this man when he was leader of the, most, uh, of the height of American power and authority around the world. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful, and so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. It was not always a given that the United States and America would have a close relationship. These are big achievements for this country, and the people of Bulgaria ought to be proud of, of the achievements that they have achieved. Uh, a fine host for the OPEC summit. I appreciate Apex on the student. <laughs> the fact that they purchased the machine meant somebody had to make the machine. And so when somebody makes a machine, it means there's jobs at the machine making place. I remember meeting a mother of a, of a child who was abducted by the North Koreans right here in the Oval Office. These immigrants have helped transform 13 small colonies into a great and growing nation of more than 300 people. The Prime Minister of India. Uh, the new Prime Minister of India is, uh, uh, no. I oppose breaching those dams. I know the human being and fish can coexist peacefully. If you're a single mother with two children, which is the toughest job in America as far as I'm concerned, and you're working hard to put food on your family. And I know the speculation, but I'm the decider, and I decide what is best, and what's best is for Don Rumsfeld to remain as the Secretary of Defense. I hear there's rumors on the uh, internets. And one of the things I've used on the Google is uh, to pull up maps. I have filters on internets. There's an old saying in Tennessee, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on Shame on you. If fool me, we can't get fooled again. Uh, fool me once. Uh, what's that saying? <laughs> now, clearly, right, and you could pull up hundreds of these clips, clearly the man was cognitively impaired and he wasn't even as old as Biden. Yet during his presidency, one can argue that that was the height of American hegemony and American uh, imperialism in its the last 70 years of its history. During the Bush administration, he initiated the war on terror, he initiated the invasion of Afghanistan, initiated the invasion of Iraq, and he drew up a whole new map and he called it a crusade. He wanted a new Middle East. So how could a leader that dumb and that stupid have been leader of the, uh, uh, of the height of American civilization? And yet the country still flourished and it still did what it did. This is just to prove the point that yes, Biden is, is definitely impaired. 
He shouldn't be leader. He's in a horrendous state. But that by itself doesn't signify the collapse of the American civilization or American hegemony. Why? Because we can clearly see that the way Amer the American government works, the way the American civilization has worked, it doesn't rely on just the president. It doesn't rely on one man. It has a whole administration, a whole ideology. It's got the Republicans and Democratic parties and, and the, over the last 50 years, the politicians have set the agenda, have set the domestic policy, have set the foreign policy. The rich elite have set the economic system and the economic laws. And then you have advisors, you have political think tanks, you have people like the Rand Corporation, you have the Secretary of State, the Defense Secretary. It's a whole team that actually puts forth policy and guides American policy domestically and on the foreign stage. And that's why, at the height of American power, under Bush Jr., as dumb and stupid as he was, they were flourishing when it came to occupation and imperialism in the Muslim world and the third world countries. Why? Because, as you can see in this picture, his advisors, people like Paul Wolfowitz, Donald Rumsfeld, who I believe was the defense secretary at the time, they were the ones responsible for the policy. They were the ones that were drawing up the plans and their think tanks for the new, to split up Iraq and invade Afghanistan uh, and invade Iraq and the new Middle East initiative. The president is just the face that rubber, rubber stamps everything. But it's a whole team, a whole administration that is actually implementing American policy. So no, this isn't the end of American hegemony. This isn't the end of American civilization. As bad as Biden was, even if he becomes leader again, and as much of a sleazeball as, as Trump is, and speaking about, you know, the, the debate went to such lows, they were talking about, the golf swings and um, sex with porn stars. I mean, there was someone in power just as sleazy as Trump, and that was Bill Clinton. And his sexual escapades in the White House are famous. Yet again, at his time, American civilization, American hegemony was just as strong as it ever was, even though he was doing what he was doing. So this by itself doesn't signify anything. It doesn't mean that American power is changing. It doesn't mean this is the end of American hegemony, even if you had another four years of Trump. Now, does this mean America is as strong as it once was? It isn't, it isn't weakening? That there aren't growing powers such as China and Russia? Absolutely not. America is definitely considerably weaker than the height of its invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. Right? economically, militarily, but this by itself doesn't mean that it's going to collapse. Why? Because there isn't an equivalent power or force or ideology at the moment that can really is challenging American hegemony. Yes, Russia is getting stronger, but it's bogged down in the Ukraine. China is getting stronger economically, yet even China with all its economic power, it can't even take back Taiwan, which is its own land, its own soil, its own country. And we still have American uh, navies, American intelligence, American uh, bases all around the world. So it takes a lot more for a country to collapse. You need an emerging equivalent power that has an ideology that's going to challenge that dominant state. And until that happens, it's going to remain in the state that it's in. So as Muslims living in the West, the politicians and... Uh, the imams and organizations, okay, it doesn't matter if you're living in America or in the UK, which is uh, the elections are, uh, uh, are very close by, just like in America, right? or in France or in Australia, it doesn't matter where you are. They're going to try and convince you to vote, and it's mandated. The Muslim, the sheikhs will tell you it's mandatory, and your vote counts, and you can change, and we need the right representatives. Your vote doesn't count, your vote isn't going to change anything. It's a facade. It doesn't matter which party, which leader you choose. The same outcomes. Domestically, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. And foreign policy, they're going to keep supporting that state. It doesn't matter who is in charge. They're going to keep the invasions. They're going to keep occupying. So don't be fooled. Don't be enticed. And no, this isn't the end of American hegemony. 
as pathetic and weak as its leaders are, they're still yet to be an emerging state that is really challenging this American hegemony around the world. So we need to understand politically what is happening, understand these systems, and then as Muslims, expose these systems, expose the fallacies, expose the weaknesses, let the people see what is actually happening. And then offer them an alternative. Is there an alternative to all of this? Is there a way forward? Is there something different? Azakumullah khairan for listening. Please like the video. Please comment on the video. Uh, please share the material. And please support the channel.